ask Linda and Brother Enrique to lead us in that old hymnal, Amazing Grace. Probably, no doubt, the most recorded song in history. All these singers somewhere have a tape with Amazing Grace on it. <laughs> Even the secular world sings Amazing Grace. But we just hope they understand what they're singing. John Newton, who was a slave trader before he got saved, wrote the words of this song. And the grace of God is amazing. It's amazing what our God can do. And we try to limit him. But if you will, let's read starting at the top of our page. Acts chapter 7. It says, then they cried out with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears, and they ran up on him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Now, the fellow that... Uh, they cast him out and they stoned him. His name was Stephen. Verse 9 said, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now, he was doing this as they were stoning him to death. And he felt the pains of death coming upon him. And he said, Lord, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Or literally was carried into the presence of God, who Jesus stood up to receive him. Only account of anyone else in the scripture we find that happening like this. But if you notice... In verse 58, it says that Saul was there at the young men's feet. Saul was holding the coats of those that were doing the stoning of the deacon Stephen as they stoned him to death because of his testimony for Christ. Can you believe that? False religion hates the truth. And basically that what was going on. The religion of the Jews was crying out for the blood of Stephen in this case. So they stoned him to death. And Saul, who became Paul, gave consent to Stephen's death. All right, Acts 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death, or his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial. And they made great lamentation over him. They wept because they had lost their brother. Verse 3. As for Saul, or Paul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, and committing them to prison. Why was he, Paul, putting them into prison? Because they became Christians. Paul at this time was of the Jewish 
of the Pharisaical religion. But again, chapter 9, uh, let me back up to chapter 8, and verse 3 again. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, and committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now Acts 9 verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, he went unto the high priest, and he desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues. And if he found any of this way or any Christian, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly, there shined around about a light from heaven. And Saul fell to the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Paul, you go into the city. And I've got someone waiting there to tell you what you're supposed to do. But we're talking about grace this morning. We've all sang that hymnal for years and years. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like Paul and a wretch like me. Saul was a wretch, and we have written testimony of what he did. He went into every house, and he would grab the people. He would make them prisoner, carry them to jail because they were a Christian. We hear a lot in our day about the Muslims and their hate for Christianity. And according to their doctrine, they would kid you if you don't believe like them. Said that we live in a day that way, but Paul lived in a day where he was part of those that were doing the killing. But we talk about the grace, amazing grace in a moment that came into the life of Paul. Grace is hard to be understood. It's an unmerited favor or a gift from God. Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. You know, <laughs> we got people still trying to help the Lord with that free gift. They're trying to earn it. not making it a gift anymore. But in Saul's life, he received that gift. Saul had greatly persecuted the church. We read a moment ago in, in, in Acts 8, verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. And when the Lord struck him down, he was on the road to Damascus to arrest the others there that were professing Christ as their Savior. He hated the church. He helped with the death of Stephen. Here was a good man, a man of God, saying, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge. 
and Saul saw him as he was stoned to death. Saul was participating in it that he consented to the death of Stephen. He scattered the church. The scripture says they went everywhere preaching the word too, didn't they? <laughs> they got about the Lord's business. And it may have been that the Lord used Saul at this time to scatter those that needed to be out spreading the word. But Saul, according to our judgment, was a fit subject for hell. Why not? He was persecuting good men, good men and women. He was committing them to prison. <clears throat> I mentioned to Brother Enrique up here before we started <laughs> a little while ago. He was talking about hypocrites in the church this morning, Sunday school, and I shared with him that the Apostle Paul was a hypocrite. How do we know that? Paul himself said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. A follower of the Jewish religion. But he was only pretending in the name of religion. And folks, there's a vast difference between religion and Christianity. Saul was an unbeliever. But he was pretending to be religious. And God appeared to Saul here and struck him down. Scales went over his eyes and he was blinded. But he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Saul was saved by the grace of God. And only by grace. God called him to salvation. And the good thing about it, the same God that called Saul there on the road to Damascus is still calling men today to be saved. But Saul was saved by the grace of God. And he gave evidence of it because he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? But the world's attitude today, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. Like Frank Sinatra said, I'm going to do it my way. But I'm going to tell you what the scripture says, that your life is not your own. You are bought with a price. And by the grace of God, we have eternal life. Not because any of it deserve it. But it's through his amazing grace. But we have evidence. You know, when a person follows the Lord in baptism, it's evident that they've trusted Christ as their Savior. It's evident they want to do what the Lord called them to do. And in this case, Saul asked, Lord, what would you have me to do? And folk, i got to tell you today, that needs to be the cry of Christians today. Lord, what would you have me to do? Saul's name became Paul, and we find that recorded in Acts 13, verse 9. But Paul wrote of the amazing grace of God many times. He was from a persecutor to a preacher of the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 2, if you will, on the back of your page. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8, or 5 and 8. Even when we were dead in sins, 
He hath quickened or made it alive, us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And it says, verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Our Lord gave Paul salvation. He gave it to him through his amazing grace. While we were dead in sins, he's made us alive. A dead man can do nothing. Y'all agree? A dead man can do nothing. Only the grace of God can call a man from death unto life. That's why even more it's grace. It's amazing grace. One without Jesus is dead, alienated from God. That's why the Lord said, no man can come to God unless the Spirit grow him. No man. But how does the Spirit grow us? But through his word. But it's by the amazing gift of grace of God that we're saved. Otherwise, we'd still be dead in our sins. If you will, look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, on the back of your page there. And last of all, he was seen of me also. Jesus was seen of me. Paul, Paul is saying this after he's got his life straightened out. And let's read verse 8 again so we'll understand it. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. I'm not me. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God. Paul said, I don't deserve this. It's amazing grace Amen. that changed the life of Paul. Completely changed him. Brother Bobby tells a story of a church he grew up in out in West Texas. How one of the meanest men that he knew went into service. A fellow that bragged about whipping everybody. But the Lord saved him in service and he came out and led many people to the Lord pastoring a church. But he wasn't a pastor when he went in. But it was the grace of God that made the difference. And that's why we sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Paul distinguished the difference in works and grace. And look at your last verse on your paper on, on the back side there, Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Folk, if you're headed to heaven, it's not because you did anything to deserve it. It's because of the amazing grace of God that came into your life and enlightened you about our Savior. And you received Him as your Savior. I've heard people say, well, you Baptists believe it. 
After you save, you can do anything you want to. You can. <laughs> Brother, Bob, Brother Tommy's got a bad dog, I just warned y'all, named Whiskey. And I'll give y'all official warning. He tried to warn a guy here some time back. His name was Pete. He said, Pete, don't put your hand where that dog, that dog will bite you. Oh, I've never seen a dog in my life I couldn't pet. He saw one. <laughs> he warned him. That dog liked to chew him up. It's not what you don't do It's going to get you to heaven. But then Ricky has learned this and, and so winning. People start telling you why I don't do so and so. I, <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible does it tell me you, you get rewarded for what you don't do. <laughs> Y'all know of a verse that tells me you get rewarded for what you don't do. Just the opposite. Therefore him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. Many others have found the grace of God and the amazing grace. But don't you notice in Romans 11, 6, that little short verse I read a moment ago has the word grace four times. Somebody says, well, are you going to heaven? Well, I don't, I don't cheat on my wife. I don't steal. I don't, it's okay. But where do you, again, where do you get a reward for what you don't do? The Lord more interested in what we do. <laughs> but that's not what brings in the amazing grace. The prodigal son is an example of a person that found the amazing grace. You remember, he said, old man, to his daddy, that you're going to give me a, an inheritance. Go ahead and give it to me now. I got some things I want to do. Dad said, okay, son, it's yours. He went his way, and he parted up. Had a big time. Had a bunch of friends. As long as he was setting the drinks up, But the money disappeared and he found himself over in a hog's pen feeding hogs to make a little spending money. Y'all ever been around a hog pen much? Eat sometimes just for the sake of what the scripture says about it. They wallow in their mire. A hog will eat anything that there is. Filthy, dirty animal. I still like pork sausage. But the prodigal son woke up and he said, man, all this stuff I'm smelling, says, I go back to my daddy and get a job from him. I don't have to tell him my son, that he's my dad and I'm his son. And he'll give me a job if I just go back. He found the grace of God when his dad heard he was coming home. He said, well, y'all get a coat and a ring. We're going to have a celebration like it never was before. Because my son is coming home. And they ran out to meet him. Everybody, almost everybody, were real happy because he said, my son was lost, now he's found. He's dead, now he's alive. 
only the brother, the other Pharisee, didn't like what was going on with his brother. But that's just an example of the amazing grace of God. Rahab the harlot, a woman that sold her body for a living, was over in Jericho, and she hid and protected the messengers of God. And God gave her that amazing grace. Millions have read about Rahab as we studied the Lord's Word. And then there was a woman at the well. Jesus said, woman, would you give me a drink? She said, wait a minute, you, you're a Jew, and Jews don't ask a, a Samaritans to drink. And he told her about the water he could give her. And he told her, finally said, go home and tell your husband. Confession time. She said, we had five husbands. And the one I'm living with is not even my husband. Hard to believe that's over 2,000 years ago, or at least 2,000 years ago, and that we still see the same thing, don't we? All right, Simon Peter was a dirty old fisherman. I don't know if you've ever been around true fishermen, I'm talking about people that uh, were commercial fishermen for a living. They smell like fish bait and the like. <laughs> but Simon Peter went from a fisherman to the pastor of the first church that ever existed on this earth. I didn't say he was a bishop or a pope. He was a pastor of the church at Jerusalem. Or at least it seems he was always a spokesman. But that's because of the grace of God. Jesus said to Peter and his brother, you guys come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. What'd they do? They dropped their nets and straightway followed him. And they became soul winners for Christ. All right. The amazing grace of God. It can save men like Saul or Paul. It was the grace of God that carried Jesus to the cross. I like that old last verse that we sing, when we've been there 10,000 years. We've no less time to go. We look forward to that time, don't we?